Hello, everyone. I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns, and I'm executive director here at All Brains Belong. And we're really glad that you have joined us today for Brain Club. And share screen, get us oriented. And if I can just ask, uh, in, the, in the spirit of unlearning the, the myths of independence, if I can just ask for um, our team to take over letting folks in from the waiting room, that would be awesome. So uh, Brain Club, Brain Club is our weekly community education program uh, for purposes of um, modeling to the community neuroinclusive culture. Um, and it's a place where we want everyone to feel safe and to experience how culture can be different as we learn and often unlearn things together. And although All Brains Belong has um, a, a wide variety of different types of programs that serve different purposes, this one is for education purposes only. Um, it's not for medical or mental health advice. It's also not a support group or a place to process individualized experiences or make personal requests or address personalized needs. Um, this is a place for, um, for education and collective learning. So we invite you to explore uh, today's big picture theme of unlearning the myth of independence and share ideas or reflections related to that. All paths to participation are okay. Um, you can have your video on or off. Even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. Uh, please feel free to walk or move or fidget or stim or eat or take breaks or anything else that needs doing. Um, observation is also a valid form of participation. And in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, in order to make this experience be safe for all participants, we do prioritize the group's collective needs over that of any individual. Um, we talk a lot about needs here, access needs, anything that is required for full and meaningful participation. Everyone with all types of brains has access needs. And there can be all different types of access needs that um, are really important and essential for participation. So some of the ones we like to address up front um, are as follows. Closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you might see the closed, uh, the closed captioning live transcript icon. If not, look for the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. You can also do the same and choose hide subtitles if you want to turn them off. And that's my visual support to open the chat, which always gets uh, closed when I start sharing screen. <laughs> okay, uh, so speaking of the chat, um, uh, there will be a portion of tonight's Spring Club with a pre-recorded video. And while that video is playing, uh, we uh, will, you, you are welcome to use the chat if you'd like to, it's completely optional. Um, you might use the chat to validate other people's comments or share how something you've seen is uh, you know, landing on you. You can also ask questions of our staff and our staff will answer. We just ask that if you are using the chat, that you use the big chat box as opposed to the reply threads, which make the chat bounce. And that can be difficult um, uh, for, for us as facilitators to manage. So just use the, use the big box if we're gonna use the chat. Um, uh, Cadence is here, um, uh, um, so it, uh, helping out with tech support. So if you have any issues related to tech problems or tech questions, please send a private chat message to tech support ABB. Um, Cadence, uh, Cadence waving in the chat, um, a private message to tech support ABB Cadence instead of everyone in meetings so that it goes directly to Cadence and you can get the help that you need. Okay, so, um, we're continuing our August 2024 theme, learning and unlearning. And um, as, as I've alluded to today, we're going to be addressing uh, the myths of independence. But first, um, just a reminder, coming up on Saturday, August 24th, um, we have our third annual Community Health Education Fair. Um, for those of you who are local and are able to join us on the Vermont State House lawn, we'd love to see you out there. And there's also a live stream uh, op option, uh, uh, thanks to our friends at Orca Media. Um, during the Community Health Education Fair, there's a portion of the event from one to three called Community Storytelling. It's basically Brain Club on the Statehouse lawn. Um, some of our uh, uh, presenters um, uh, include H. Kumar, who is a nine-year-old um, autistic child 
um, who is a non-speaking communicator and will be performing his poetry and a rap song that he's written um, and that I think is going to be really, really powerful. And um, there will also be a music performance by Todd Jevry. And you'll uh, have the opportunity to hear from um, many of our community members on panels during the community storytelling portion. Uh, for for information about um, about the event, Lizzie, can you drop the uh, the link in the chat to the community health page? So uh, for those of you looking for more information, for folks who are local, we would also love your help. We are uh, we would we are grateful for anyone who would like to uh, to to get involved with the event um, in in any capacity as a volunteer. We have all different kinds of roles available. Um, and so, uh, Lizzie, if you could also drop the volunteer link, that would be awesome. Okay, so here we go. Um, independence. Independence is a very loaded word, a word that is seeped within oppressive power systems. Um, I, for one, um, have been grown up in a culture that is um, largely dictated by um, you know, white supremacy culture, ableism, capitalism, all the isms. Um, I've been taught since uh, maybe even uh, early toddlerhood, right, that independence is the goal, and so many people have been. Um, and independence is overly glorified and, again, reflective of the underlying cultural systems in which uh, many of us exist. Um, so, um, the, when we explored this topic at Brain Club last year, and Lizzie, if you could link um, the recording from the August 2023 on learning the myths of independence Brain Club, I played some videos um, that were like, you know, kind of like tongue in cheek, like the videos were serious, but I was playing them with tongue in cheek because they were so ridiculous. This is a video that I'm not going to play right now, but we played it last year. Um, it's basically like, yeah, I can do it on my own. Look at me. I can do it on my own. Um, as though that were the end all be all. Um, and this video I am going to play because it's so ridiculous. sound how to encourage your kids to become more independent grown up enough to start being independent and what are some things you can do to help encourage your little ones to become more independent we're going to dive into the topic of independence in this video but before we do do give this all right the concept being um that the idea that uh, parents, uh, how this video started, I queued it up to the wrong place uh, because I tried to do something independently without asking my team for help, um, uh, is that it's like, well, your baby's born. What's, when's the soonest you can start, you know, expecting them to be independent? It's like, oh, man. You know, but, but really, what is wrong with being connected to and relying on other people, provided that they are people who are safe people, right? So we talk a lot about interdependence at Brain Club as a core part of neuroinclusive culture. And so tonight, what I'm going to play um, is a, 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 a panel from last year um, actually, a year ago this week, it was uh, right. It was a it was a staff meeting on the eve of us re releasing the Everything Is Connected to Everything uh, resource, um, which has uh, um, and Lizzie, if you can drop the link to the All the Things project in the chat, that would be great. Um, which is a a, a a project that took um, you know thousands of hours and over over a couple of years um, related to the health conditions that autistic and ADHD um, teens and adults uh, very commonly experience and struggle with, and it was a very 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 big project. Took a lot of time, a lot of effort, um, not just of our of our staff, but like our uh, m many many of our community members. In fact, one hundred members of the ABB community who worked on this project. And very, very, very proud to say that a year later, it's been accessed by more than 15,000 people around the world. And so this video was recorded before it was released. 
It's a video of a very stressed out me trying to do things independently and my team co-regulating uh, with me and all of us reflecting, why is it that it is so hard to unlearn the myth of independence? So let me stop share, drag my video over and turn my volume up, which I couldn't do in the middle of playing that video, which is why I stopped it. Reshare. Hey team, it's all the things Project Eve. This is my list of things that have to be done in the next several hours. So in full transparency, I am having a lot of dissonance because I am not asking for help in appropriate ways. And there are barriers to me asking for help, namely there are barriers I made up. Number one, we work really hard not to um, inhabit and perpetuate urgency culture. And me being like, hey, we got to do the things. Can you do the things? Can you do it right now? Like, I want to not do that to other people. So I, I take it and I keep it. And I, I feel it. Like, the urgency is actually still happening. It's just contained here. Um, I also like my impression management of like what people think of me plays out like all day long. I wonder, does anyone else experience that where like it's hard to ask for help because of like the stories that you're telling yourself about about it? What yeah, does I that think all three for? of us, all three of us were <laughs> nodding, nodding. nodding. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. like even in a culture where like we like like cortically, like my cortex knows that this is a team that I can ask for help. I am still not asking for help. Right. Because it's like it, it like lives. It, I think it lives in one's nervous system and I think it's I think it's like a trauma response I think it's a trauma response that like dates back to childhood about like all the dysfunctional teams I have ever been part of or like all of the you know the like the feedback around like you know you're there's something about you functioning on a team that is like not desirable Right. You still have that voice. At least I still have that voice in the back of my head always saying, oh, well, if you ask for help, then people are going to think that you are not able to do it and they're going to think that you're incompetent. Um, and I think there's also, at least for me, there tends to be a lot of, oh, well, if I ask for help, then maybe they won't do it the way that I want it and I just do it myself anyway. Um, and I think that's a really... I think that can be a really hard part about interdependence for at least my flavor of the divergent brain where I like I like things done the way that makes sense to me. Um, and that's I mean, that's part of the hard part about collaboration and interdependence. Yeah, for, for me, my voice is I don't want to be a burden to others and I don't want to put this on your plate that's already full and I should be able to get enough spoons together for myself to figure it out and not be a burden. Yeah. Or there's like the comparative thing, like other people would be able to do this. Other people can figure this out. So what's going on with me that like I'm struggling right now. And so it's really easy to just isolate in the struggle, even when you have a team of people that are safe and have shown you that they will show up and support you. It's still, like you said, it's hard when, you know, all the way back to family of origin stuff, you know, trying to cortically override that trauma response is really hard. I also think 
I mean, it's actually pretty new in the big scheme of things. Like that, I don't, I think this is like the first, like, this is the first interdependent team I've ever been part of. Like, I don't have any experience, like actually playing out. It's kind of like, do you remember that time on New Year's Eve when we screwed up the link for our like our event that was starting in 30 seconds? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and like I like never want to feel that again. And I never want to like recreate that emotional experience like for anybody. But yet at the same time, it like I look at my list and it like kind of feels like that. And so I'm like, well, if I just hold on to that and I like keep it, I, it, it feels like, like I value so much our team that if I have to choose between dividing and conquering and like maintaining the integrity, like maintaining the team, like I will choose I will choose the team family every time, which is also kind of dysfunctional. I mean, that's the part of working with a with a team that you, I mean, actually like, <laughs> um, but also just kind of like working with a team where you really respect everybody. And when the, I mean, I think working in dysfunctional systems and knowing that this is something that I don't want to do this is something that I hate doing that feels really horrible for me to do it's really hard to put that on somebody else or to ask for help with that because you know it's a miserable task and you know it's something that um I mean that's the reason that we delegate often is because it's something that we don't necessarily want to or is difficult for our brains to be able to do well that's really interesting right can we like let's let's stay with that idea because it's interesting that your brain says, I delegate when it's something that is hard for me. Um, like that makes sense. It's interesting that your brain does that because my brain doesn't do that. My brain mm. says the thing that is hard for me, I will keep and I will suffer through and I will slog through it because I can't imagine being responsible for any of my team members feeling the way I feel about this task. Mm. That, that's what my brain says too. And I find that I will reach out to ask for help if it's like really going to severely break my brain, but I won't reach out if it's only gonna break it a little bit. Right. Yeah. I think one of the helpful things about being in a team where, and I think Mel, you've done a really good job of this for our organization, is very specifically asking people what, um, basically like what their strengths are, what is easy for them to do, what they're able to do well, even if it's not easy, and having that known to the rest of the team. So like, I know that filling out forms and paperwork is something that I don't mind doing. I love you. Don't like doing that, so I'm fine I taking you. over. Whereas making a phone call is something that I really hate doing, but I know somebody else on the team doesn't mind that, so it feels easier to delegate, knowing that even though that's something that's really hard for my brain, it might be something that's not as hard for somebody else's brain, and it's okay to delegate. But you only know that if you ask. We we have members of this team who don't hate making phone calls. That's new information to me. I think we have members of the team who it doesn't ruin their entire day to make a phone call. Fair. That's fair. Okay. Maybe not well, enjoy it, but. Doesn't, I mean, I think that like comes back to our, like our first team retreat like a year ago when we like reflected on, you know, what are the things that, that like come really easy to you? What are the things that like will destroy your day? And it's interesting because what I remember about that, and like we can go look at it, um, but like what I remember is when asked in an open-ended way, what are the things that destroy your day? Um, it was actually kind of hard to answer that question when other people started giving examples and someone's like, oh yeah, me too, that, that, that destroys my day, it does. Um, but like, there's so many things that destroy my day. 
Um, so I think there's, and like, I think that it comes down to, like everything comes back to an awareness of access needs and like, you don't know what your access needs are. You just know that your day has been destroyed. And especially when you like have this narrative of like all the times your day has been destroyed and your, your, the story you tell yourself about that is that there's something wrong with you, which is why the day was destroyed because you stuck. That also, I think, plays into this. I absolutely agree with that. I think that comes back to, I can't remember if it was you, Lizzie, or you, Sarah, who talked about kind of the comparing to people and the, and the, oh, other people are able to do this and get through their day and other people can, whatever, work a 12 hour shift. Why can't I do that? Other people are able to make a phone call and still go through the rest of their day. Why can't I do that? Um, People are able to take a shower and like also work after that like who knew right but but then when you like build awareness like you know when you when you when you think about like the all the things project like through the lens of understanding you know the shower for example you know with the heat and the temperature and the gravity and the mass cells and the you know all of it like and you're like oh like obviously that's why it costs an entire day's worth of energy to do that thing but like there's so many other things or, or, you know, like when Lizzie and I like Lizzie, we have so many examples where we like like things that break our brain. We're aware like now, I mean, a year like a year into this, we're aware of like there are certain patterns that break our brain because it involves shifting between two documents or shifting between two websites. And so we have evolved this this strategy of like, well, well, we don't do that we don't shift between two websites anymore. And we've evolved these kind of workarounds that like one person's on one website and the other person's on the other. And, you know, I don't know that a year ago, I wouldn't have, I don't, I don't think I would have thought of that. Yeah, I think the first step is understanding, you know, what drains your battery. And that's what All Brains Belong has helped me to do is to like really reflect on like what really is giving me dopamine and what is draining my battery here. And it takes, you know, understanding that in an interdependent interdependent team, like different people are going to have different areas that, like you were saying, Sierra, like that are that are that are work for them and or that drain their battery. And understanding that like as a basis of, you know, how to function as a team. And figuring out those workarounds so that hopefully the battery doesn't get as drained. Slowing down and giving yourself permission to ask and be okay if something drains your battery, that you're not a bad person and there's there isn't something wrong with you, that it's okay that your battery gets drained like that. And to not heap shame on yourself is part of the process. Because, uh, like, there's different buckets of shame. So there's the shame of, like, there's something wrong with me that I need help. So, like, I mean, intellectually, I think that, for me, is the easiest one to talk myself down from. The other ones are much more subtle. It's like, well, if I ask for help, that means something else about me. It's not that, like, I'm, you know, like, so, you know, Sierra gave the example of, like, if I ask for help, you know, they'll think I'm incompetent. Like, I know you won't think I'm incompetent because I actually don't think I'm incompetent. Like, what I, what I think you might think about me is that, like, I'm a micromanager and, like, I'm a tyrant or I'm a whatever. Like, that, that I actually think is possible depending on how I communicate what I need help with because like those are the messages like those are the ones like when I was when I was a little kid like I didn't get the messages of like you're incompetent like that was I mean there are people who like you know their parents set them down and they tell them that and that super sucks and that stays in your nervous system I didn't get that one but I got the you're selfish you're self-absorbed um all that matters is you your way or the highway so like anything that comes up that gets to those messages like that's what that those are my barriers. Like like I wonder if we can like think about are there any like common themes of buckets around the shame like the shame barriers to interdependence that we could talk about? 
So I think part of breaking down the shame is like having somebody else to teach you. Like, it's okay to like call someone up and be like, Hey, can you just be on the phone with me while I'm doing this thing? So my eyeballs don't fall out. Like that to me feels like the, one of the first steps is like seeing it modeled around you. Well, I've learned about body doubling through All Brains Belong, you know, and and like Lizzie will call me and be like, can you like just be on the phone with me? Because my eyeballs are going to fall out if I try to do this by myself. And I'm like, sure. Yeah. But like, I wouldn't have thought to do that before, you know? And, and this is the first interdependent safe team I've ever been on. So like, I feel okay to call Sarah and say, hey, my eyeballs are going to fall out. Mm. You know, and I know Sarah's not going to laugh at me or think less of me or anything, you know? The opposite. Like I actually, like we've talked about this before where it's like, I actually trust people more who are like, this is hard for me. I need help. Or I don't know the answer to this. I'm trying to figure it out. Like that actually builds trust for me with other people. So it's like the authenticity, the vulnerability, like engenders trust. And yet, it is still hard to ask for help. Like Lizzie, you gave the example of like, well, if it's only gonna break my brain a little, I just stuff it in, you know, like I, it's only one like, you know, anyway, so like what what is it about that? Despite having like cortical awareness that you belong to a team of like people who get it, what for you, what do you think, what's the barrier? Um, I think it still comes back, back to the, to the voice in my head that says you're going to be a burden if you ask too much right i don't want to be too much and those are the right. stories that i had too, i was too, too much. much right too so much that, like, that's another always bucket, too, much. too much yeah 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 mm -hmm. from yeah. childhood i'm too much yeah yeah you have to stuff it yeah and not be too much right because if you're if you're too much people won't like you yeah I think a big one for me is the like everybody else is already busy. Everybody else is already at their limit. Um, and how to right? How to how to how to ask for that help <laughs> from people who um, you know are already approaching burnout or really busy or busy with their kids or busy with their family or busy with work or whatever that looks like and with kind of urgency culture and with kind of over productivity culture i think it's fairly rare to find people who don't feel like they're busy and there isn't enough time in the day already right and so i think that goes back to that burden of hold on i'm gonna i'm gonna let gabe in and then like give them an out if they don't want to be part of this oh and the little thing it's gonna say are we recording Hi, Gabe, do you want to be in the tail end of the brain club conversation? Otherwise, can you leave and come back in two minutes? We're What's happening? Let... We're finishing the brain club recording. Oh. Yeah, for the um the interdependent. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. So, no, it's okay. If you don't want to be <laughs> do you in you want to te text me? Just text I'll me. I'll text you when it's done. Okay. Okay, great. bye. Bye. <laughs> I don't want to loop that in. Anyway, um, <laughs> um, what else do we want to say? The other thing that just, I mean, we'll see if we use this and like maybe maybe some kind of meta application of 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 this conversation around like so. It's actually objectively true that I know I can't do all these things. Like I I know that. I did get organized to at least like operationalize what are all the things that have to get done. I of course did it in a way that is very difficult for it to be shared because it's on paper. Um, I could like type it out and make it into checklists. And in fact, I think I will do that. And then it might just be a matter of like, I think what my brain would allow me to do would be to like to invite others to self-select the tasks that would not break their brains because mm -hmm. actually many of them are not 
they're not terrible tasks. It's just that there's too many of them. I like that system. I think allowing people to to self-select, especially if you, I mean, I think at that point you need a team who's going to do that and going to be willing to help. But I think that, I think that that decreases the pressure of, okay, what are you having to do the kind of emotional and mental labor of, okay, what are the things that this person finds easy to do? What can I assign to this person? What are the things that this person finds easy to do? And actually taking that off of your plate as well. So people are like people are like in the trenches. They don't maybe they don't even like belong to a team where people talk about this kind of thing. Like where do people start? Think like what you like Lizzie and Sarah, what you guys were talking about about body doubling. I think sometimes finding like that one person who maybe is also struggling or also like you've talked about like has a similar brain as you or struggles with similar things as you or whatever that looks like um and doing asking for help in a way where you're kind of helping each other like doing bottling or or body doubling or creating tasks or um just talking through things together i think sometimes that can feel a little bit easier versus hey can you do this for me of hey can you help me do this together or can we work on this thing that we both have to do that's good advice i think when i think back of like previous workplaces that like the team dynamics were not like ours are um like that is that's a strategy that i i think i used a lot because it like on at on first blush, it absolutely appears that, quote, everyone else can do the thing. And then when you identify like literally anyone else who struggles to do the thing, that has like a huge impact, at least for me. And then you like, you know, in real life, like there's a whole lot of people, you have a whole community of people who struggle to do the thing in isolation because you're not, suppo you're not supposed to be able to do things in isolation all the time. Like that's the whole point about interdependence. everyone um before we open for discussion i just want to remind us about our community agreement and uh whenever whenever we be when we open up for discussion whether that's in the chat or out loud we really do want to be thinking about the group's needs including allowing for processing time so if you've had um, a chance to share um, we want to make sure that we can pause and give space for others who haven't had a chance to participate. Um, you know, we all have different brains and different brains have different needs. Um, and there are many, many community members who um, they really do need there to be space um, out loud or in the chat in order to actually join in if they want to. So just wanted to remind us about that as we open this up for discussion. Oh, I forgot to turn my video on. Um, Sarah. That was so much fun to watch that and think about like how much we've like grown as a team since we recorded that. Um, and I would also say that one thing that was striking me as we had that conversation and listening to it again was um, was just that like it's not a linear process of like, sweet, so I've figured out what my access needs are. I've overcome the shame and ableism of, you know, family of origin stuff, like childhood stuff. And like, now I'm good to go. Um, it's really practicing it and like struggling with it and practicing it with it again, you know? And I think that, um, yeah, I think that having compassion and grace for that process um, for ourselves and for others uh, is really important on the journey. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, even e even today, even even as someone who talks about this all day long, um, you know, not just with our team or for myself or with our patients um, or when I'm doing trainings for employers, like I, I, 
I'm still on the journey, right? So even today, we had a team meeting and a project came up that was really hard for my brain and I got snappy. Um, and because we have this open culture of communication, um, Gabe and Lizzie were like, hey, let me take this task because I think this one's not good. This is not helpful for your brain. Like that's normalizing a discussion of access needs is how you get to a place like that. And it requires, I think, not it, it requires a baseline culture of safety. You can't just be like, yeah, I'm going to be authentic and disclose all my vulnerabilities authentically. Like, no, you can't do that. You can't do that unless it's safe to do that. And you're going to know. You're going to know if it's safe. Um, Amy. This conversation just reminded me of um, how many aspects of all brains belong have have served me, like not only medically of like other patients helping me figure that out or like crafting and just seeing the diversity of like, you know, use their brains and or they're interested in. Um, but I think also just sort of like when someone else admits that they need help with something, that there's like this community of people who are saying, oh, I've needed help and here's a safe person to get that help from. Like I just had a um, a meeting today, like a three hour meeting with Porter Knight, who like is an, a productivity and organizer, organizer. And like, I had to admit that I had 70,000 unread emails and I'm like, okay. And I'm like, I feel like I'm at a doctor's office. I'm like, I'm dressing for, and there was so much compassion and so much respect and so much ease. And like, this person has an expert, like I had no idea that they had like a neuroscience background. So for me, it was just like, they were able to explain things about my brain in the beginning of like what happens when I have a limbic response and not accessing. And I'm like, Oh my God, that's why I like, I can never think about things, you know? So we just had this whole thing. And if somebody else in the community hadn't been willing to say that they had that need and then share that with me to disclose that I wouldn't have been able to like literally just start having systems immediately impacting and cognitively unloading so much stress that I've been holding for years so I I just love it that it's like the staff models this interdependence and then the community comes together and that Mel I do believe that as a leader you know in the organization that you really model like when you're having a PEM experience you know you're not able to like do the thing you'll say oh this is dyspraxia or this is like you're literally showing us in the moment of what it looks like to be dyspraxic and be okay so if I show up to a group medical visit and I'm like oh my hair or the, I remember they were, in the beginning you were just like oh what like you're here we're like we you don't have to change one thing Amy and it just was there's just so many ways that that has woven the community of interdependence and safety and fun and trust and I hope everyone, if they can't come to the community health education fair uh, in person, I really hope you think about getting online for that because I think it's going to be such a special moment for us. I just want to pause, um, pause and linger on what you just said. That is so deeply meaningful to me. Thank you, thank you, Amy. And I think, you know, what, what, what you said reminds me of is like, you know, how radical it is to show up and be authentic. Like, really? Um, but, but yeah, yeah, it's a radical thing to show up and be authentic and then be, you know, have other people around who are like, oh, I don't know, I've never really had a place where I could be authentic before, but like, all right, I guess we'll try it. And then you, more people do it and do it. And then now we have a community of people who can show up authentically um and for that you know it, it, it takes uh, a great so at the beginning it takes a when you're coming into a space like this um you know if you've never experienced that before it can feel really unnerving of like what you know this how is that gonna you know is this a place where that can happen for me and um you know is uh, are people gonna talk about me when i leave and like all the things that go on from all of the traumatic experiences of being in in, in environments where it's not safe to be authentic
summer summers uh, sharing they too have learned much and can now spread awareness so that's uh, that's that, that's amazing and i think it's about um you know uh, uh having um the um when we think about like vulnerability and authenticity there there's a lot of bravery that is is required when you when you can like um feel out the environment um and then you know tr reconnect with your intuition or to trust when you feel that it is safe to participate in your own way um and it still still i think re really requires um you know uh, I, I think about uh liz liz carney's comment um uh you know this radical act of trust we play that video a lot because it's one of my favorites um and that's what it reminds me of Um, it, 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 it also, you know, just connecting that to a comment that Sierra made earlier while we were watching the video um, about, you know, I consider giving someone an, an, an out and a zoomed out way part of consent in general, part of part of ethical employment, right? So when we think about like a, a workplace environment, when people do not feel safe participating in anything, like normalize that too. Sarah. I guess where this is kind of taking me, I mean, and possibly obvious to everybody else, but it just feels like such a lovely continuation of where we were last week about, you know, it's like that what you're, it's, it's like, how do you build a neuroinclusive culture? How do you go about doing that? Um, and, and how do you do that when, how do I, how do we, how do I do that when I'm not having a good day? Or how do we do that when one of us isn't having a good day? And, um, you know, so much of my life, I just wanted to sort of show up. I, I had, I've had such a mess going on in me that I just wanted to just sort of show up and dump it on other people and then have every, other people take care of it. And, um, and the, and, and like, it's diff, like actually building neuroinclusive culture. It's like, it, it's like, it means it, it's, it, it, it's like, it takes, it's it's a there's like, like that 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 model that I had in my head was one of no responsibility on my part for for what for for either my impact on other people and also no responsibility I mean and and also no responsibility for building the culture and giving back what to the culture what I wanted from everybody else in the culture and so I think there's this like it's like people are looking out for each other, but for every, you know, you know, and so I can look sort of look longingly at, oh my God, ABB has built this wonderful culture, but it's also like ABB has built this wonderful culture because everybody at ABB is working their ass off to build this wonderful culture. I mean, everybody is like giving 100, 150% of what they have to show up for each other and, and, and making a lot of sacrifices to do that so that so that people have a culture that they can rely on. And so I think that's the the thing is that it's it's not just it's not it's it's not it's like I it's not just like a building a space where my brain can belong. It's a building a space like if it's if it's just I show up and dump it's just my brain belongs. <laughs> you know, if it's all brains belong then 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 I have to actually like, you know, I, I show up with my brain, but I also have to like look out for your brain too and and really show up for your brain too and care about your brain feeling comfortable as much as I care about my brain feeling comfortable. Thank you. Thank you for naming all of that, Sarah. And I think like much the other the other part that came up last week about that is that when you do not feel regulated when your nervous system is not regulated like at a nervous system level um you may not one may not have access to the part of your brain that allows you to perspective take to you know have access to the impulse control to create space or the impulse control to you know not not say a certain thing that you know it, it, it's it's those are brain skills it's not it's it's often not for like lack of wanting 
to show up in that way. It is like, it's just, that's how the nervous system works. And I think that when, when we have access to those parts of our brain to be, to like, you know, maybe, maybe, um, you know, uh, have that shared, shared vision, shared buy-in to a collective goal, but those are like, you know, skills of the thinking part of your brain. And when you're dysregulated, you don't have access to it. And um, that's where, that's where, um, you know, repairs come in. We have miscommunication, communication breakdowns and, and repairs. That's all part of neuro-inclusive culture too. Thanks, Sarah. Sierra. Um, yeah, I just, I, I think, Sarah, you kind of said what I was going to say. Um, just in terms of like, I think that with, we're talking about this with employment, but the way we make change is when this kind of comes back to every individual person, these same ideas of, you know, learning your access needs and communicating them and act and asking other people their access needs. Um, that's what makes like interpersonal relationships work. That's what makes um, healthcare work. That's what makes all the things we talk about work. Um, and so I think, I, I think a lot of times when talking about neuroinclusive employment, I can often get stuck on um, what the employers do. And that's a really important part of it. But also knowing that for a lot of us, a lot of us aren't employers and a lot of us can take a lot of these things and put them into action and do things and, make our workplaces as best for us as possible and for the other people there by using these practices, even if we aren't at the very top of the organization to make these changes. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I think that, um, and, and uh, Lizzie, I don't know if you, if, if it may take too long to find it and that's okay. We'll have it, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll dig it up eventually. Um, when uh, we, we've, we've got several posts on social media about this, about like, how does an everyday person, Lizzie, I'm, I'm thinking about the one that it's, it's like, what do you do when you're in burnout, but you have to go to work today? That post, if you can find that one, I think that would be a good one to throw in the chat. Um, because there, there may be some, thank you. Um, there may be some things that, um, you know, cause, cause we, cause we think about like how much privilege comes, comes, you know, it, it is when you have autonomy or agency to like, you know, design your environment and control your work setting your environment. But, but there may be some things that someone has agency to effect, even if it's not everything. And, um, and, 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 and because systems are designed to perpetuate systems, um, there may be some really dysfunctional systems that someone has to operate in. And they don't have the economic privilege to be able to quit their terrible job that's hurting their health. And but, and they have to show up. And there may be still some things that people can do to, to make little changes. Um, I think about an old, an old brain club. I don't remember exactly when it was. It might have been last month or the month before um, where we're that was the topic. It was like little things that you can make. Like it was in the um, small, small changes, uh, big impact brain club. I think that was in June. Um, and we, we talked about like, well, if you learn that you have the kind of brain that gets more fatigued when the lights are on, you know, do you have agency to dim the lights? Um, and, you know, it, it could be little, little things like that, that, that really do add up and make a huge difference. Lizzie, look at you. You found that post. Thanks for doing that. Love to make space for anyone who hasn't had a chance to share either with mouth words or in the chat about what's what's coming up for you around unlearning the myths of independence.
I have the kind of brain that doesn't feel the passing of time in a linear way. So uh, it feels, you know, it feels like I'm waiting like an hour, but it's really only been one minute. I'm like objectively looking to remind myself and reassure myself that it in fact has only been one minute. Um, oh, hi, Deborah Ann, um, uh, who shares uh, amazed at beliefs I grew up with uh, and thought I was the only one. Thank you all for sharing and revealing and inspiring. It's possible. Beautiful. Thank you, Deborah Ann. And Tara says, super helpful to see you guys model healthy communication and interdependence. Yeah. Thanks, Tara. Right. And, 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 and you know, I think it it's also one of those things that it, you know, we didn't know each other before. So we just you know, we, we like, like any group of people, um, it starts from a, like, Hey, we, we have this, we have this vision where I, it's like what Sarah just shared, um, where, you know, my, my, my goal is to not, you know, is to, is to, you know, for you to have your access needs met too. So it, it, it requires a real curiosity around, um, you know, and, and often when we have team meetings, you know, we spend a lot of our time in team meetings reflecting on like, what broke your brain last week? Like when, when did you feel awful, right? Because, and, and, and in the social media post that Lizzie shared, that's one of the prompts, right? Because I think a lot of times people, if you ask, if you if you like stop someone on the street and you say, hey, I'm curious about your access needs, what are they? Like, they're gonna like, like what are you talking about? What does it even mean? Um, so it's more about maybe you gotta work backwards. So are there times where you feel extra awful? It is usually because you had a need and it was unmet. And now you feel awful. So maybe you didn't know. Um, so like in last week's video, I think it was uh, Sarah on our team who shared, you know, I didn't actually know that I had a, a like an access need for more processing with the chat. But now I see that when the chat's going really fast at Burn Club, like my brain explodes, right? So guess what? I just learned I have an access need for slower processing in the chat. Okay. Well, oftentimes, like it's like the working backwards thing, as opposed to are there days where, you know, I feel I feel pretty good or at least neutral, because that might reflect that you have an access need that's met. Um, and so it's it's and then, of course, it's the reflection on like, what what do I have agency to be able to to, to share? Retreating from, from Beth, Samuel and I feel as though we have wandered into the most beautifully wallpapered room. What an amazing space you've created. Oh, this is the highlight of my day. Thank you so much for sharing on it. Yeah, and I agree with Sarah's comment in the chat um, about the fluidity of our capacity. Like, I might be able to do the thing at like 9 a.m., but come 9.05, I've lost that capacity. I have used all my resources because I was, and, and if that happened, if there was a drastic change in my capacity between 9 and 9.10, that meant that whatever I was doing at 9 o'clock broke my brain and was not done, not approached in a way that, that that, that worked for me that I may not have been, you know, mindful of, not just, you know, beyond agency, autonomy, et cetera, but I may not actually have been aware that this was something that I, that, like, really I needed to be done differently. And that's, you know, a good learning experience. I'm reading uh, Martha's question. What are some suggestions on how you can pinpoint where your access needs are unmet when you feel overwhelmed but cannot figure out why? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so um, I'm going to, um, I uh, I'm going to open up the link that Lizzie posted and I'm gonna share screen because I think visual support for what I'm about to say might be helpful. So this comes from our Instagram. It's a great question with the, can I make this bigger? Okay, so um, is this not even the one? This might not be the, even the one that I wanted. Sorry, uh, hold on. I was so specific and I was wrong. Um, all right, so this one. So concept, we all have access needs. So uh, th this, this, this might be some prompts for self-reflection to see what's not working. And I don't know why I'm just overwhelmed and everything's terrible. What, you know, what drains my battery? When am I exhausted? When am I stressed? When do I shut down? Or when do I flip my lid? When do I doubt myself? And like collect information about that. And, and, and when you are feeling better, then maybe you can kind of figure out whether one of these things is relevant to that. But first, just kind of track your patterns um, as opposed to 
Um, when do I feel good? You know, do I have a sense for what feels good or do I feel at ease or at least neutral? Do I have, you know, is there anything that I can think of maybe not even now, but things in the past, is there anything I used to do that made me feel better um, that, that actually worked? Um, and maybe, maybe you incorporate some of those things. And I'm going to put that link in the chat. Um, it's reading from Linnea. I'm appreciating the importance of knowing where I am in terms of nervous system regulation and attempting to offer communication in groups and personal context when I am feeling subtle. Linnea, that's so important. That is such an important reflection, right? And so, um, and, and, and I think um, it, this, this idea of like attempting to offer or attempting to enter a conversation or attempting to, to attempting to do anything I think it's all, it's, it's equally as important, um, you know, in part of culture here for us to name over and over that observation is a completely valid form of participation. Um, I think so many of us grew up in like, what, what happens in school, you know, you get participation points and, you know, it was like part of your grade and stuff. Like there's no right way to participate. Um, I have a seven year old and when they were three, um, they, uh, or maybe four, uh, they, they, they said, mama, I'm a learn by watching type. Yep. Yep. Nothing wrong with that. Um, Martha, uh, on our Facebook page, we post, we pretty much, we don't, we, we don't know what we're doing. We're not, we're not like marketing people. We're just like people trying to do the thing and like see patients and run groups and like try to do all the things um so like we we make one post and we we, we put it in both places it's exactly the same so uh, not a, not a lot of value added um uh you know checking both or they look different they will look exactly the same so if you're a facebook person and not an instagram person you can find it there too maybe we have i think on in instagram we maybe have more videos um because they don't look that good on facebook because mostly because we don't know how to use facebook yeah anyway um so um, I'm reading, reading Sarah's uh, comment in the chat when I start making excuses to myself for why I think I'm failing, there is often an unmet access need hiding in there. Yeah. And I think also the like self narrative of like, what does it mean to fail versus succeed? And so if success is defined as showing up and like having this like extroverted presentation in the world, like, and that's not who you are, that doesn't mean you failed. Um, even if society sends the message that there's one right way to show up in the world. So it's uh, really, re it's, 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 uh, and I think that um, when there is this, and I think like what Sarah said, um, I think is the same sentiment as our post of like, when do I doubt myself? So when I feel that I am failing, I am dysregulated and there's something that happened that dysregulated me and took me back to my old narratives. Well, uh, it's it's seven o'clock and uh, that wraps us up for today. Um, we look forward, we're really appreciative of you being here tonight and we look forward to seeing you next week. Next week, um, we will be uh, continuing our uh, learning and unlearning, um, this time in healthcare. Uh, we're gonna be revisiting um, a panel of physicians who practice in the traditional system, um, sharing their journey of learning and unlearning um, about uh, neurodivergent health. So uh, we look forward to seeing you then. Have a good week. Bye.